thanks for giving up your Tuesday night to come out here. Churchill Mining started off as a, a mining company, but it's disappeared away from mining at the moment and its primary focus is on arbitration in re regard to a coal mine that it had in Indonesia. The board of Churchill is made up of uh, the following, myself as the chairman, Nicholas Smith, who's our managing director, is here tonight. Greg Radke is uh, a legal person, formerly from Parlour Investments, one of the main shareholders. Nick Rosinski in funds development from Singapore. Farah Louia represents uh, an Indonesian group of investors who currently own about 16.5% of the company. And Kiran Vadlamani is a Singaporean investor who owns about 13% of the company. So just a bit of a summary on Churchill. Churchill listed 2005 on AIM as a junior resource explorer. It raised a sum tally of one million pounds and was looking for bulk commodities and started off its, its life in Western Australia and then moved to Indonesia. First cab off the rank up there was an area called Sendawa. We did a bit of exploration up there, didn't come up with anything and moved on to the East Kutai area, which is, from a resource point of view, great, but from a, I guess, a resource nationalisation or expropriation of resources point of view, was something that was completely different again. So Churchill's sole business at the moment is BIT arbitration mm -hmm. against the Republic of Indonesia. So what's a, what's a BIT? It's a bilateral investment treaty. What does that mean? I guess uh, a bilateral investment treaties are basically agreements that set out the terms and conditions that investors have from one country when they go and invest in another country. The treaties generally include things or incorporate things such as fair and equitable treatment, um, protection from expropriation, um, means for repatriating funds, and fair protection from the law in the country that you're in. These treaties also have dispute mechanisms in them and it's usually by way of international arbitration. There's currently about 2,500 bilateral investment treaties in operation between various companies in the world, or various countries in the world rather. And in the UK, these treaties are, are controlled by the Foreign Office. The UK currently has 118 bilateral investment treaties with various companies, various countries rather. And the majority of these refer to ICSID as being the body that's responsible for the dispute resolution, if there is, between investors and the state. And the Indonesian treaty that there is between the United Kingdom and Indonesia came into force in March 1976. The events that led to Churchill's change of focus were we discovered this world-class coal deposit. It's a thermal coal deposit in the East Kutai region. It was some three-odd billion tonnes of medium calorific thermal coal. It had very good characteristics in terms of ash content and sulphur content, which made it quite a, a valuable commodity in terms of a blending feed. And it was certainly a highly sought-after coal from the marketing work that we did on it in India and in southern China. Come to uh, move forward now to 2010, and Indonesia revoked the licences that Churchill had an interest in, Churchill and its subsidiaries had an interest in. So we're currently pursuing Indonesia for $1.315 billion, which was the figure determined, determined by a a valuation, specialist valuation firm called FTI, who are based in Toronto. And in terms of the process, we had our most recent <coughs> hearing at ICSED in Singapore in August of this year on the issue of document <coughs> authenticity. And I'll talk a little bit more about the document authenticity phase a bit later on. The ICSED forum itself is an in-camera forum, so we're not allowed to say a lot about what goes on inside the forum until such time as the tribunal publishes it. There is a website that details all of the procedural matters and decisions and rulings. 
that's available via that link. And there's a list of uh, oh, maybe 50 or 60 different procedural steps that have gone on in this arbitration since it was first filed for in 2012. So here's a bit of a potted summary of the background and historical perspective of Churchill. In 2007, we acquired the 75% interest in the East Kutai coal field. Between 2007 and 2010, we did a lot of exploration work and we delineated a world-class deposit that had 2.73 billion tonnes of jork resource that incorporated 960 million tonnes of jork reserve. We carried out a detailed feasibility study at a 30 million tonne per annum production rate on it, with further studies being done to increase the production rate to 50 million tonnes a year, incorporating a dedicated rail line. In April 2010, we appointed Credit Suisse out of Singapore as the strategic financial advisor, with a view to look at funding, to look at selling down our stake in it, to fund our share of the capital development that was needed for the project. In May 2010 was the official date when the revocation decrees were issued by the East Kutai Regent, a gent by the name of Mr Israel Noor. And Churchill didn't get notified of those revocation decrees. And when they finally emerged, they came to us via Credit Suisse in Singapore. And when confronted with these faxed copies of them, the East Kutai Regent said that no, they weren't his. So you're left running around in circles to say, where do these things come from? Are they real? Anyway, they turned out to be real. We carried on with our feasibility studies from April, May, completed the 30 million tonne conveyor feasibility study and the 50 million tonne per annum rail feasibility study. And with the revocation came the usual appeals to various courts Firstly, there was the Court of First Instance in Sangatta, Samarinda, whereby uh, that court upheld the Regent's decision to revoke these licences. We subsequently appealed that to the High Court in Jakarta. Uh, the J ha Jakarta High Court uh, carried on or validated the First Instance Court's decision. We subsequently appealed that to the Indonesian Supreme Court and the Indonesian Supreme Court also upheld the Court of First Instance. We engaged a British firm called Herbert Smith to uh, undertake those appeals, and I guess it's telling that in every one of those appeals, they didn't win the appeal, and not only did they not win them, they never won a single point on any of the appeals, points that were put forward for consideration. So with the closing of the Supreme Court of Indonesia's decision, or the issuing of that decision, Churchill at the time then had no claim on the East Kutai coal deposit, and it was effectively gone. And that was when we filed our request for international arbitration under the terms of the Bilateral Investment Treaty. So, again, Hicksid's another mnemonic that you don't see a lot in the mining space. What's ICSID? Where did it come from? What does it do? ICSID's one of the five groups of the World Bank that's charged with looking at the settlement of investment disputes. It was established by convention as part of the World Bank and the UN back in 1966 when 20 nations ratified the formation of that convention. There's now over 150 countries that have signed on to the ICSID Convention, and ICSID's primary duty is for the facilitation and settlement of investment <coughs> disputes between uh, nations and individuals or companies that have invested in those nations. <coughs> it also does hear cases or provide advice and facilities on jurisdictions such as the North American Free Trade Association and now the, the Trans-Pacific, the new Trans-Pacific Trade Organisation that's just been put in place. Moving on, 
Once we filed our case at ICSID, Indonesia challenged ICSID's jurisdiction to hear this particular case. So there was a standalone hearing held on the aspect of jurisdiction. And in February 2014, the tribunal ruled that it did have jurisdiction under the terms of the Indonesian-UK Bilateral Investment Treaty and also the Australia-Indonesian Bilateral Investment Treaty. The need for the Australian Bilateral Investment Treaty was that Churchill's subsidiary, a company called Planet Mining Proprietary Limited, was an Australian company and as such the terms of the British Treaty didn't apply to uh, the Australian link in the ownership of Churchill's Indonesian companies. And at the time one of the requirements for what was called a PMA company in Indonesia was that it have two foreign shareholders. And the two foreign shareholders that owned the Indonesian company, Indonesian Coal Developments, were Churchill Mining, PLC, the London company that owned 95%, and Planet Mining Proprietary Limited, the Australian company that owned 5%. Hence the two treaties. And when you look at this case on uh, exit, you'll see that there's two separate cases that have been consolidated into one case for purposes of the arbitration. In uh, June, following the ICSID Tribunal's decision on jurisdiction, we filed our independent valuation by FTI of Toronto at $1.35 or $315 billion. And in September 2014, Indonesia filed an application to dismiss the case on the basis of document authenticity and it requested a standalone hearing to address this issue. It wasn't something that we were really happy about at the time, but uh, I guess with the benefit of hindsight, it certainly provided us with an opportunity to deal with this issue of document authenticity. And when I say that, what I mean is the, the Indonesian government have said that the signatures that were applied to the earlier versions of the mining licences, i.e. the general survey licences and the mining exploration licences, were mechanically applied to the documents of the licence documents themselves. And according to Indonesia, that was not proper, that was done by somebody, and it was illegally done, and those licences were not valid. The subsequent licences that were issued, being the exploitation licence, have never been in question, and they were the licences that were valid at the time the revocation of the licences <coughs> occurred in 2010. So, these are the mechanics of Churchill's claim at ICSID. It's quite a complex claim and a comprehensive claim, but these are the headline points that Indonesia initially supported and encouraged Churchill and Planet to invest in the East Kutai <laughs> Coal Project. We would have spent circa $60 million on exploration, feasibility studies, sundry other things. In that regard, in East Kutai, we regularly filed our reports, paid our rents, paid our environmental bonds on invoice from various Indonesian bodies. And Churchill, we invested in, in Indonesia in compliance with all of the terms and conditions that were set out on those licences. But the Republic of Indonesia, namely the Regent of East Kutai at the time, Mr Noor, undertook a series of unlawful actions that resulted in these licences in which Churchill had an interest being revoked. And that led to the subsequent Indonesian court um, challenges followed by the International Arbitration Challenge. Uh, just a, a note on the damage, I know we've spelt it out, but uh, in June 2014, in accordance with the orders that we had from the Tribunal, we were required to file our valuation. Suffice to say that we internally thought that number was quite small, but uh, it is what it is. And at this point in time, unless it's challenged by Indonesia, which it may well be at some time down the track, then we don't have an option to go back and revisit it. However, uh, our clever legal people have said that if Indonesia disputes the figure, then we will be able to go back and revisit it. 
Our own internal working suggested it was well north of the two billion US dollar NPV. What it didn't take into account or provided no value for was the 1.7 billion tonnes of resource that was unmined at a, after a 29 year initial mine life. How do you value something that's sitting out in NPV terms at uh, you know, 30, 40 or 50 years out into the future? So these are questions that, that still remain open in terms of the valuation. A little word on, uh, on ICSID. I mean, as I said before, established 1966. It's a multilateral treaty, currently has 150 odd uh, states signed up to it. Its primary purpose is to provide facilities for conciliation and arbitration of international investor state disputes. And the United Kingdom, Indonesia and Australia are all signatories to it and it's considered the leading investor state dispute settlement regime. So the legal team, if you're going to go into bat on the legal side of it, uh, lesson one is get the best legal team that you can. We started off with uh, a firm called Quinn Emanuel and we've subsequently changed the team to uh, Clifford Chance. Clifford Chance is headed up by uh, Mr Audley Shepherd, who's the global head of ar arbitration in their London office here. He's supported by uh, the two partners in Perth, Ben Luscombe and uh, Dr Sam Luttrell. Uh, we also have a guy in Singapore, Ms Shetty, who's a partner of their Singapore office. We have a couple of other guys in uh, Hong Kong, um, Ramesh Wiranti and Montse Ferrer. So we have a great coverage of legal team across, across all the time zones. And you can see by some of the comments there, re really Clifford Chance, that they certainly have a very good reputation in the area of international arbitration. Just a few more comments on them in regard to Clifford Chance's history and record in terms of international arbitration and in particular in the ICSID forum. Okay, the last 12 months, as I said before, the tribunal did order a standalone hearing on this issue of document authenticity. And that hearing was set for uh, August this year. The scope of the hearing was quite narrow in that it was designed to take note of who signed these impugned documents, uh, how were they signed, and what were the legal consequences of some other legal issues such as estoppel and acquiescence, fair and equitable treatment breaches that would come to play in the case. So the hearing considered that. It also heard a lot of evidence from both uh, Indonesian and Churchill witnesses over an eight-day period in Singapore between 3 and August of this year. And Earlier on in the piece, there was a number of pieces of correspondence that were received from Council for Indonesia, who's a Washington-based firm called Curtis Mallet Prevost, that they were no longer alleging, as they had done earlier in the piece, that uh, Churchill was a perpetrator of this mass scheme of fraud that they were looking at. We consider the whole thing a fairly contrived argument but it is what it is and we'll deal with it as we deal with it. In uh, 2015, we filed requests for document production and we filed our memorial in response to the various document authenticity allegations that were raised in May of this year. The tribunal issued orders for document production to both Churchill and Indonesia in June. And further document production orders in July. And interesting to note that Indonesia refused to provide many of the documents that the tribunal ordered that they should provide. These tribunals don't have coercive powers, like they don't issue summonses or they don't, uh, and they can't force you to come. Their, their main regime in that regard is the request for adverse inferences against the person who hasn't <coughs> complied with the orders. 
So we've asked for a range of adverse inferences against Indonesia for not providing documents that were ordered. And again, without going into the detail of them, on the ICSID website there is a, a list by the tribunal of what documents weren't and what documents were provided. And uh, I'm sure that they'll take that into consideration. Now we got, we got to the August hearing on document authenticity and the first thing that happened there was the person who was responsible for all of this, our good friend Mr Isran Noor, he refused to attend the hearing. Not only did he refuse, but uh, he did it in a way that was pretty contemptuous. The chief of the arbitration panel sort of said, can you give your evidence by video link from Jakarta, seeing that you can't come to Singapore to do it. And he said, not too busy. Can't come, can't come at all. And as a result of that, his evidence in its entirety was struck out. And the consequences of that evidence in the formal pleadings that Indonesia put forward also became quite suspect in a number of areas. That we've filled out and we've identified in our post-hearing briefs. So, we've gone through those two stages of post-hearing briefs now. They were uh, 50 pages for the first post-hearing brief to be delivered no more than eight weeks after the end of the hearing, followed by a second reply post-hearing brief that was lodged last week. And all of the material is now before the tribunal to consider and they'll issue their decision uh, in due course. When's due course? I don't know. It's a uh, how long is a piece of string. I guess you can take some, some guidance from the fact that the original jurisdiction decision took circa nine months to, to come through the ranks. Um, whether this one will be shorter or whether not, I just don't know, but uh, I expect that probably somewhere around June next year we would be in a position to have some better idea of when it might be. And of course, like all court decisions, there's no advertising of when it is. Oops, it's about run out of time. So, here's the, uh, here's the Churchill arbitration investment story. You can see down on the very, very bottom left-hand side of it, that's where we currently sit with a market cap of about circa £25 million. It's probably a little bit less today because there was a, a bit of a down movement since this graph was prepared. You can see where the value of it was in terms of at the time of expropriation, which was £143 million. And you can see, for comparison, where the FTI valuation sits out the other side. So, it's a pure arbitration investment value play. It has no, no linking to coal price, it has no linking to resources, it's purely on the strength of the legal case that's currently before the tribunal. And a little bit of corporate data on Churchill. Parler Investments remain the largest shareholder with 23%. They're a Swiss fund and have been in the company since uh, pretty much it started in Indonesia. GL Global Investments are the Indonesian investment group. Cause First Holdings uh, own 13% and that's Mr Vadlamani's group. And at the moment we currently have about $2 million in the bank but uh, we don't have a lot of need for cash at this point in time with the arbitration or this, this stage of the process now going into uh, I guess a bit of a a slowdown in spend activity. There's not a lot of need for us to raise new money at this point in time. We'll consider what the arbitration panel does and when their decisions come out as to what's the best option for funding the next phase of the, the legal challenge. And, okay, here we are. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions, please? If you have a question, raise your hand. Please wait for the microphone. We've got quite a few here. Hi, can I, can I just ask, is it on a no-win, no-fee basis? <laughs> if not, how much have you spent so far on legal fees and what's likely to be the final cost? And will you get your legal cost back if you win? 
Well, starting with the back end first, the legal costs, yes, are part of the settlement. All the costs are reserved at the moment in the action. In terms of the fees going forward, at the moment we have fully paid up with all our fees to um, Clifford Chance to take us through to the completion of this, this particular session, this document authenticity phase. We are exploring other options in terms of fee structure or m money to pay for legal fees going forward. There are a number of litigation funders who are in the marketplace at the moment and they're all quite keen to talk to us simply because this is a case that's now been progressed through five years and it's been fully funded to this stage internally from the company. What's the magnitude of fees going forward? Look, I guess it's probably going to be in the order of 3.5 to 5 million US dollars to take it right through to the end. Uh, is that going to be best raised by equity post the decision? Possibly, I don't know, when, until we get the terms from the litigation funders that we've been talking to. And lastly, what have we spent on legal fees right through the process? Well, I guess you probably need to badge it up to not only with legal fees, but you know, with uh, we ran a very active media campaign in this very early in the piece with a major global media group called Krebin Gavin Anderson out of Singapore, out of Sydney and out of here in London. Together with uh, challenges that went on in the earlier Indonesian courts, number circa 27 million US dollars to date. I had a couple more questions. Um, yeah, yes, you've been answered. Any other questions in the room? Glenn? Uh, just as a worst case scenario, if, if you did happen to lose the case, uh, two million in the bank, five million of, of legal fees, what happens to the shortfall and, and who bears that? Well, we don't intend to lose for starters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I guess that's an uh, interesting question. Obviously, there's there's costs associated with uh, the state running their case. But it's like a lot of things, a lot of the costs that have been incurred to date by the state, say for example the jurisdictional hearing, we might have spent three to four million dollars on the jurisdictional hearing, which was won by us. If it had not been challenged, the state would not have had to have spent any money on the jurisdictional challenge. So the, all of those sort of things need to be considered in the wash up of what the actual total fee part of it is. It's not, you don't win the end and you get everything. If you hadn't challenged on this, uh, we're quietly confident that we're going to uh, walk past this document authenticity phase. So <coughs> all of the money that's been spent on that by the state will also fall onto our side of the ledger, if you want to think of it like that. Uh, gentleman here. Yes, I just wondered, was there any truth in the Reuters report uh, earlier in the year that you were in discussion with the Indonesian government now for court settlement? Uh, look, there's always rumour going around in the press. Every time you talk to somebody, uh, you'll get somebody coming along and saying, oh, they must have been talking about something. But no, there was no truth in that at the time. Lady over here. Oh, no, we're done. How much were the shares on the market? Sorry? How much were the shares? How much are they today? <laughs> oh. what's, what's, the, what's the current share price? I think, I think about uh, 16, 16 to 18p, something like that. Um, I had one question um, to conclude. Should the licences be handed back? Um, and would there be... Is this, this the right environment for a large-scale project that the resource would um, require? Would you, would you rather, rather take the money? Or would you rather have the opportunity to develop? Well, again... First question, last question first. Uh, no, we don't want uh, the licences back. The licences <laughs> are gone. The licences, all rights to our licences or to our claim on those titles was extinguished when the Supreme Court ruled in Indonesia. And for us now, it's just purely a damages question. Would we accept the licences back in some sort of a transitional ownership structure? I don't know, you would have to consider it. We don't want the licences back. We don't have a lot of faith in the Indonesian operating environment. Do you want coal at the moment? Look, it was a big enough deposit 
to get economies of scale going with it. As everyone who's been in the resource industry knows that as the price of commodities go up, go up, so does the cost base that comes with it. And as the price comes down, so does the cost base that underlies it. I'm quite confident that you could run that operation at its 50 million tonnes a year in an economic way at the moment, even at today's price. You, know, you only have to look at what's happening in West Australia and the iron ore industry at the moment to see that the big iron ore players have halved their cost base over the course of the last 18 months with lower inputs, with lower spending, <coughs> with lower capital input. It's, uh, yeah, it's just the way things are. There's always a bit of a lag, but the cost curve will always come down when the commodity price starts coming down. Lovely. Okay, David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.